Well, my name is John Snyder. I'm a current PhD student at Baylor along with Breck. And today, uh, let me share my screen here. There we go. So today we'll be talking about a survey that I did uh, in the spring about the top selling sacred choral music uh, of the past decade or so. Uh, this music was, and what we'll be looking at today, was music to break up the octavo rut. By that I mean uh, we've all heard a lot of music, and I'm sure that we have it in our libraries, of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge with a modulation up a whole step, and we do the chorus again at a forte dynamic, and we call it good, typically with piano accompaniment. So today we'll be looking at five pieces uh, that don't follow that mold and that can expand the musicality uh, within our church choirs or any other kind of choir um, without being too difficult, but still changing up our musical vocabulary. So the survey that I did uh, sent an email to many, many publishers, probably 15 in total, um, and received responses from six. They're listed there on your screen. Uh, Morningstar, Lorenz, GIA, Walton, Beckenhurst, and Hope Publishing. Uh, but the a problem occurred in that various information was shared. Uh, some publishers shared their top 10 pieces. Some shared their top 100 pieces. Some for uh, sacred and secular. Some were just sacred, which is what we're looking at today. Uh, others were varying timelines. Some were a decade. Uh, some were 13 years because that's what they had um, just moved over in their systems. Some were all time. So compiling these together, uh, tried to weigh it equally between the different publishers that responded. I ended up with a final list of 200 selections. These all were then broken down. So taking a look at those 200, different problems there that came up. Um, from the final list that I had, there may be some composers or trends that were highlighted while we left others out. Um, because Beckenhurst sent such a wealth of information, um, there was a lot of Craig Courtney and John Nesbeck. John Nesbeck, the founder of Beckenhurst, and Craig Courtney, who's there now. Um, but there is also no Joe Martin, and there is limited Dan Forrest, three of the 200 pieces, uh, which if we were to somehow get an accurate information list of the top-selling sacred pieces, I'm sure that uh, Dan would be much higher on that list, and there would be plenty of Joe on that list as well. Uh, one problem that I came across is that there was no sales data sortable by the number sold. So um, these just being the top selling pieces could be, are they truly the most popular going to the most number of choirs? Or did one festival buy 5,000 copies thus making it a top seller. Uh, and I don't haven't yet figured out a way to parse through the data to find one way or the other, um, but still those are some problems that we came and ran into. Uh, so here are some trends that came across in these 200 pieces before we start looking at a couple in particular. Uh, first was the emphasis on the English language Many of these pieces, uh, 192, were in English, which makes sense, being mostly American uh, and, pro and some um, from the UK. But that goes to show the amount of English that we're singing within our services, at least uh, in English. Uh, one German piece, one Spanish piece, and six in Latin. Of those six in Latin, uh, four were mass settings, as we'd expect. Uh, for the voicing that was broken down there, uh, a good large chunk, uh, about 80% or so, uh, were for SATB and or SATB with either a solo or divisi into um, SSAATTBB. 
smaller numbers there that you can see, 15 being for SAB or SB being kind of two part of sorts. Um, we'd like to think that all of our choirs are singing SATB parts, but we know that there is wealth of strength and goodness in uh, SAB versions as my cat joins the presentation today. Um, even smaller than that, we have four that were two part, <clears throat> uh, four or four for SA or treble choir, and then one for TTBB, which would be uh, bass choir. And then six were from one to three parts. These are labeled differently than um, SA or TB, um, being parts one, two, and three for children or developing choirs. Uh, under the accompaniment, uh, this number didn't come as much of a surprise. The 165 of the 200 were accompanied, uh, whether that is by organ, piano, or keyboard, uh, being fluctuation between the two. Um, but 84 of them used or at least had versions with non-keyboard instruments. So they were scored for organ or orchestra or with brass, with brass and percussion, with handbells, with guitar and drums. Um, so it was, it was good to see that almost half of the 200 uh, have this flexible instrumentation so that we could do it in the small church, which only has the one piano, but also in the bigger settings where we have full orchestras. Also broke it down by church year and theme. As we could expect, 35 were for Christmas, uh, a short number thereafter for Easter, as those are when we expect to see those big numbers in our churches, uh, and then smaller settings from there, whether by theme or by church year. And then the, the last number, which was a little surprising to me at least, uh, coming from, as a scholar, uh, were the biblical sources. So this is the total number that had uh, scripture either cited or directly in where the text came from sure that many of the others have biblical references, whether it's a, a line or an allusion to something, um, but these were specifically cited. As we'd expect, 17 Psalms, uh, but then 12 epistles. Uh, that was a little interesting that we'd use 12 of those New Testament letters uh, in our music. But meanwhile, flip side of that, um, only nine from the Gospels, eight from Isaiah, uh, many of those being the uh, Old Test um, Advent canticles that we'd expect, um, turning swords into plowshares and, and other ideas like that from Isaiah. Uh, and then six other Old Testament uh, citations, a couple of which from creation in Genesis, uh, and then some following David. So that gives you an idea of the repertoire that we're looking at of these 200 uh, highest selling pieces, however that's defined. So now we get into the meat of why you're here today, hopefully. Uh, these are five pieces that break that mold of the octavo that we had talked about earlier. The first one that I want to share with you is Choral Fantasy on Creator of the Stars of Night by Michael Larkin. Uh, this one it weaves two ideas of chant together and although the recording here does take it at a very steady tempo, I think this would be a great introduction uh, to those uh, choirs or congregations less familiar with performing and using chant. Um, so we have here at the beginning of the second verse, if you will, um, the creator of the stars of night. But then uh, about halfway through, we introduce of the father's love begotten, which is a more familiar chant. Uh, but nonetheless, you could use plenty of rubato, plenty of stretching, whether it's word stress or um, pairings of twos and threes, different conducting styles, all of which to break away from that normal idea, uh, whether dealing with creation uh, or from Advent Christmas. So let's take a listen to Choral Fantasy on Creator of the Stars of Night. So
So that one being a, a great blend of those two chant tunes going together, um, I think this Advent season coming up when our choirs are back together finally, um, I may actually try and do that a cappella. And so having those two chant lines together floating around the sanctuary, uh, what a wonderful sound that will be. For something a little more upbeat from there, uh, we turn to Rise Up by Mark Hill. So this is a traditional spiritual that has been arranged here. Um, and we think of those traditional spirituals uh, the that Dr. Thomas talked about yesterday in his session, uh, whether it's Ezekiel saw the wheel or um, wade in the water. So here's one that I was less familiar with, uh, Rise Up, Shepherd, and Follow, again, for Christmas. Um, but this gives a different feel to that Christmas idea. So whether it's to break up that Christmas Eve aura of everything that is quiet, um, giving a an option that is not silent night, uh, but this is just a great tune uh, with a moving bass line from your basses uh, in a more pop style. So we hear Rise Up uh, from Mark Hill. Rise up. Rise up. It goes on from there in a couple other verses. Uh, this one also features a soprano solo there in the third verse, uh, giving a chance for improvisation. But again, a nice way to break up those Christmas standards uh, that we've all heard uh, to give us something new to hear on Christmas Eve uh, or in the Christmas season. Next, we turn it back to something a little slower. This is uh, Jeffrey Honore's Lord Poor Mercy. Um, if you're looking for something that is not in that octavo style, but much closer to um, a homophonic motet, I think of the, the luscious sounds of like Anton Bruckner or something like that, but yet more accessible and more diatonic, uh, this is a wonderful find. Uh, most of it in just four simple voices, uh, which really brings out the simplicity of the text, of uh, our prayer, asking for God to pour mercy, tender mercy, and love on us to show God's face. Uh, so here we hear, Lord, pour mercy.
And we'll end there on that dominant wanting for more. Uh, so as we look at that, uh, we hear so much of a Kyrie, if you come from a more liturgical setting or, or something very appropriate for the Lenten season or just a Sunday on confession. Uh, I don't want to say easy, but straightforward work uh, with that, that voicing there, but giving us a chance to look at uh, intonation or line uh, that sometimes gets overlooked uh, when all accompanied or at a faster tempo. Uh, one more or two more to share with you. Uh, this is Verlei und Frieden Mendelssohn, which I thought was very interesting that uh, on this list of top sellers from the past decade or so, um, we would have a Mendelssohn piece from the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and so although it is available in the public domain, I really appreciated this edition that was the top seller, uh, primarily because it features all three uh, languages there. So you see the German and the Latin and the English. Uh, Mendelssohn set the text three times within this setting. Um, Grant unto us thy peace uh, or something similar to Dona Nobis Pacem. Uh, and so you could do each verse in a different language. You could start with the English, go to the German, end with the Latin. Depending on your setting, do all three in Latin. Um, so we'll pick it up here. Uh, this is the only one with organ, by the way, um, of these five that we're looking at today. Of course, there were many more on the list of 200. Uh, and so we'll pick it up here going into the second time through the text and then into the third in which we hear uh, all four voices in homophony.
that might be one of my favorites coming out of this list of 200. Um, the one thing I, I will point out about the language, um, if you are uh, a little trepidatious to it is repeated three times with the same text. Uh, so once you learn about, I want to say eight lines or so of the poetry, uh, you are good to go for the whole anthem. So really that's uh, including your whole choir there in that last verse sets up the two previous verses, which use the same text. If you are a little scared of the German. Uh, and then the final selection for today, um, on that great, great morning, Mary McDonald, who has done several of the works in the reading sessions uh, that we've heard this week so far, uh, this is just a great go get them kind of piece. Uh, we hear the an Easter anthem of sorts um, in a spiritual style, though not a spiritual. Um, and so four voices breaking up that mold. What a way to get us energized on Easter morning. Jesus rose to life that day. There the tomb was empty. They said, Jesus is not here. He's alive. Great morning, hallelujah. On that great, 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 great morning, at the rising of the sun, those who saw the tomb was empty. The victory had been won. He's alive. Go, go and tell him Jesus lives forevermore. He's alive. Great morning, hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Yes, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, he's alive. What a great, great day. Oh, Jesus is alive. Yes, Lord, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, he's alive. What a great, great day. What a great, great day. He's alive. And it goes on from there, uh, expanding in its joy. Uh, so each of those, kind of a different approach to the norm that we hear in the church choral world these days. Um, here are some honorable mentions, if you will, um, that made that list of 200 top sellers, but we don't have time to look at today. Um, and I will post this in the documents after the presentation. Um, a couple to take a look at uh, the Christus Paradox there near the bottom. Um, another setting of... Um, now I can't think of it. I'll, it'll come to me. Um, but they're saying all the things that God and Christ are and are not. Um, right? A servant and a master. Um, a Lord and a disciple. Things like that. Uh, a little higher on the list, we have the Palmont's In So Lord Jesus kind of a standard in the repertoire that is still hanging in there in the top sellers. Um, and then near the top, Patrick Quigley's Steal Away uh, was performed at ACDA uh, two years ago now. Uh, just a great setting using soloist um, that can take us in that direction. So I thank you for your time. If you want to post any questions in the chat, I am to answer them. Um, I don't see any there now. Um, otherwise, I can turn it over to Breck, who will lead us in uh, some other repertoire, uh, a little bit further afield than mine, uh, but still nonetheless, some great rep. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, yes, and hopefully not so further afield that everyone hates it. So let's see. Okay, and I'm sharing and you can hear me. Okay, perfect. So um, what I kind of wanted to do was one of the hard things about keeping your choir fresh and also engaging the music education aspect 
of the choral directing profession um, is to occasionally have some pieces that may challenge. And this kind of goes along with, with um, John's idea of getting out of just that rut of this verse, chorus, verse, chorus um, cycle where they things start all sounding the same. So I think you can say a lot about the pieces that we'll hear in a second, but they probably won't all sound the same. Uh, so there is that. So um, what I wanted to do was um, take a different piece for each of the liturgical seasons. Um, and I use that term as broadly as possible because I wanted to have the most um, ecumenical uh, view of what that means, liturgical. So um, trying not to focus on one tradition, and I know that different traditions have different names for things, but um, I, went, I went with the standard uh, liturgy. So um, I had some requirements though, because I wanted to show that you could actually use music from the concert repertoire of the 21st century um, that's available in octavo, that's under seven minutes long, that's in English, um, that's liturgically appropriate, um, a cappella or keyboard accompaniment, so something that even a church without a big budget to, to hire instruments could do, um, suitable for smaller ensembles, so you don't have to have a giant choir to perform these pieces, um, accessible for non-professional singers. Now, that doesn't mean that these are necessarily easy pieces, but they are pieces that with rehearsal, non-professional singers can perform. And, and this last one is just totally my personal opinion that they are of a high artistic merit and, and they don't sound so much like, uh, you know, the, the publishing machine choral world. Um, so my, the, how I divided up was starting with Advent, um, then Christmas, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, and Ordinary Time. And I didn't include um, a lot of the big standalone days. I tried to go with, with seasons that lasted longer. The only, uh, you know, seasons that lasted for at least a few weeks. The only exception to that is Pentecost. Um, I know different traditions treat Pentecost as a season or as a day, but um, I'm using Ordinary Time, um, as the, the time after Pentecost before Advent. Uh, Pentecost, the reason I wanted to still still have something for that is that sometimes it's hard to find good um, Pentecost music or, or um, pieces that are about and um, toward the Holy Spirit in their focus. Um, so you can see here, if nothing else, I hope you take away from this presentation that there are names of some composers who all of these write primarily for um, the concert hall. So these are gonna be on the level, the same kind of, you, you may not like it as much, but these are gonna be professional composers like Mendelssohn, but writing in the 21st century. So they have, you know, their professional life is in the concert hall, driving the new music that's being written forward, but they've also written these pieces that are approachable like Mendelssohn did, which can be performed by church choirs. So the first one I want to start with is O Radiant Dawn by James McMillan. Um, he is a Scottish composer. Um, and um, what's great about him is that he is, he and Arvo Pert kind of go head to head a lot of who's the most performed living composer in the world. And James McMillan has written symphonies and operas and string quartets and uh, you know all these major works and, and, and beautiful passion settings. He's really f has focused a lot of his output on um, the days leading up to Christ's passion and has himself already set two major passion works. And these are huge. A lot of his works use at least two choirs with orchestra and they're, they're big events. But he spent most of his career as a parish choir director uh, at his local parish in Scotland. And he has a, a collection of motets that he wrote that are called the Strathclyde Motets. So if you're looking at, at the music of James McMillan, on the one hand, you'll have these massive pieces, but then you'll also have these very approachable pieces 
they're not necessarily easy pieces, but they are approachable pieces that that can be done very performed very well um, by you know your volunteer choir, and they don't require a lot of resources because that was the kind he had a non professional choir um, that that he directed there. Um, so this comes from the antiphon. Um, you know, the, the O antiphons that are during Advent where we get, you know, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Well, this one comes from the O antiphon for December 21st. Um, so, and now we'll take a listen to this and hopefully my sound will come through.
So I played the whole thing because I know it has a repeat, but I loved it so much and I love the way that all works together. Um, and with the repeat, you know, you have this piece that a good solid piece that's that's long, but you don't have to re rememorize all these notes because it's even half of the, the work is repeated for you. Um, the next piece I want to play is uh, a choral piece of the Texas's own David Ashley White, um, who is another man that that has a foot in two different worlds, um, where he is, um, you know, a, a professor at University of Houston, and he also is a composer in residence at a church in Houston at, at an Episcopal church there. Um, and this is a setting that he did um, by the poem by Christina Rossetti, which I've, I've put up here. Another thing about a lot of these pieces also is um, Dr. Terry York would, would always say that truth does exist and we should have beautiful words in, in church to remind us that truth exists. So um, I, I put the words up here too, because I think that these pieces also have a lot of beauty and theological accuracy in their text, in the poetry of their text. This is, so a poem by Christina Rossetti, um, not written for a church setting, but a Christmas poem about, about Jesus, very spiritual. And uh, it's a short piece, so we'll take a listen to that. So a lovely um, shorter work, um, very, you know, I think sometimes as a, a composer, simplicity is one of the hardest things to get to write. And I, I love the directness of that piece. It'd be a wonderful addition. It, it's not something, um, it's not one of the tunes that everybody hears a thousand times at Christmas, but very well suited for the Christmas season. Um, the next, uh, the next piece is another composer who has a foot in the church world and a foot in the concert world, and that's Julian Walkner. Um, he is the director of uh, Trinity Church Wall Street in New York, um, and he um, is the director of music there and leads the one of the main choirs there. Um, and this is from a, a much larger work, but it's sold as a separate octavo. Um, but it's it's a setting of the out of the depths, the De Profundis, um, Psalm 130. Um, and so um, we'll hear that now. This one, again, it's only four voices. Um, it's It sounds more difficult than it is. Um, and I wish I could have the score for you uh, to show you, but, um, but it is available um, for purchase. So let's take a listen to part of um, Psalm 130, the great Lenten piece. Oh.
just for time, but I hope you got a little taste of that. That's definitely um, the most difficult of, of the ones that um, that we'll listen to, but a, a really great, great setting of that familiar song. Um, this next one is uh, uh, Bob Chilcott, who I think probably we're, we're all familiar with his music, um, but this was for, um, he wrote this for the Easter from King's service from the King's College. And, um, but it was, they did it live, but it was during quarantine. So this was, this is a quarantine piece uh, that they did last year. Uh, so this past Easter actually. So this is a, a brand new piece, but it is available. Um, and it's a setting of a familiar text that you've probably seen and maybe in your, your hymnals. Um, of uh, by JMC Crum, uh, now the green green blade riseth, but it's a new melody and a and a new setting again in four parts um, with with organ. But um, I love the way that uh, Bob Chilcott writes the organ part. Kind of gives the feeling of a spring day, and you hear some bird calls in the organ, and not in a kind of messian kind of way, uh, but it, it's it's just a it's a really unique piece from him and um, anyway I hope you enjoy it let's listen to it.
and I hate to cut I hate to cut a piece off, but I want us to hear a little bit of these things. And John, um, I will definitely answer those those questions later once we've heard them all. But very good question. Um, this is a, a setting of Veni Sancte Spiritus, but um, it also includes the, a translation of of that Latin prayer in English. So it actually includes Latin and English. And for most of it, you'll hear women singing in, in Latin and men singing in English, and then they trade off at the end, um, at the very end. But um, it's uh, it's by the Canadian uh, um, choral conductor and composer, Mark Sirrett. He's increasingly in, in, in Canada, at least, has, is becoming a kind of a, a, a sought out clinician, chor choral clinician. Um, but I think this is a great setting if you're looking for a good um, Pentecost uh, setting. Um, it's another more difficult piece, but definitely can be done. And um, I think it's worth looking into. to cut it off there. Um, but you'll notice that there were more than four parts in there. There is Debussy um, in, in this, but it's not extensive. Um, and the even the Debussy, it's, it's similar between the parts. Um, so for ordinary time or the, the Sundays after Pentecost, um, I took a composer that I'm sure that most choral people are familiar with, Arvo Pert. And like James McMillan, he's performed all over the world in concert halls um, and in churches um, for concerts at churches. Um, his music is well suited for a large, you know, cathedral style space. Um, but I wanted to take one of his um, his pieces, a newer work of his from the from the 2000s, um, based on the prayer of Saint Patrick. It's also known as Saint Patrick's Breastplate, um, but you you probably be familiar with it when you see it. It's in English, which he's increasingly been setting more choral pieces in English. Um, and so, um, but it's a really interesting work. It has some limited Debussy, but you'll notice that um, 
with a lot of parrots works if you teach them by playing the notes out on the piano and having the choir memorize them they'll never learn it but if you have them learn it with solfege because it's all based on these triads um, his tintinabulation style it actually is very accessible you can solfege a lot of arvo parrot's pieces and this is this is an example of that to stop that there but for time um, I'll stop it before we get to the end and stop my share um, but I'd welcome any questions and and John I'll, I'll answer you uh, you asked uh, do you have a personal favorite of these works um, I, that's impossible I would probably say um, the the Arvo Pert or the Macmillan would probably be my favorite um, but that's hard to say 
And then your second question, how do you go about finding accessible works by some of these less uh, accessible composers typically? Um, and you know, the nice thing about a lot of these composers that they're easy to find their works published. And a lot of these publishing sites, now you can select your exact group that you have. You're like, okay, I have this many voices, they can do this level of stuff and it will kind of narrow it down. And, um, but some of these on here, you know, just because I like to stay up with, you know, the new the new choral rep, and so I just kind of listen and go, oh, I kind of like these. And you know what? I think I could have my choir do something like this. I'm um, we're going to start working on the um, Macmillan in a few weeks. Start on it so we can have it in time for uh, for Advent because I I think that would be a, a special setting for that. Um, and the the David Ashley White is is just beautiful it's a beautiful and the bob chilcott i love too because it's it's such a beautiful melody and and it's you know it's it's strophic in in a way where that that soprano line is really stays kind of the same and so there's something for the choir to hold on to so it it takes it from being just overwhelmingly difficult all right yeah any other questions Thanks for everyone who attended and and left comments. Yes, yeah. thank you all for being here, uh, whether live with us on Thursday or seeing the recording later on. Uh, hopefully yes. you got gained some pieces from this that you can take back to your choir or at least think about some ways to get away from that, you know, standard <laughs> machine, as Brett Breck was saying earlier, that to expand your vocabulary.